William & Mary is an amazing campus, partly due to two of its vital organs, the Sadler Center and the Campus Center. Here is a brief glimpse of what it means to be a student manager of these buildings. Welcome to the Sadler Center. Right here, we have the service elevator. We typically use the service elevator to transport six foot tables, chairs and anything we need to finish a set for a student event. These are the monitors that we use to display information about various events going on in the building. Always remember to turn these monitors on when you open the building and to turn them off when you close the building. Now you can see the furniture set up. It is crucial that we adjust the furniture to make sure that it looks professional and is well kept. It would be a good idea to adjust furniture as you go on your routine rounds of the building. This is the study lounge. As you can see it has various computers that students can utilize throughout the day. Now we are approaching the York Room. The York Room has the exact same setup as the James Room that is next to it. In the York Room, it typically has a basic setup of LCD pack. As you can see, the projector, projector screen is down. The VGA cable is connected into the wall outlet. Following the appropriate audio and visual procedures. Ensure that in carpeted rooms you do not utilize the tape as it is a fire hazard. This is the AV storage closet. Within the AV storage closet there are various cords, cables, we have Jeff carts which is used for more complicated audiovisual setups. We have projectors. We have everything that you would need to set up AV for any student event. Students or various groups typically make requests through Robin and they are placed on the iPad as AV orders that either the building managers or the AV techs are responsible for setting up. Always ensure that room cards are being created before they, you close the building and being placed in every room card slot. This is the Tidewater room, Tidewater A. Tidewater a and Tower B are carpeted rooms as well, so you would not utilize the tape. You would utilize the core protectors that are located within the AV closet. This is an air wall. The air wall separates Tower A and Tower B. This is the AV booth. This is the room that controls most of the audio and visual for the Commonwealth Auditorium. Typically, AV Techs man the booth for more extensive events. This is the sound board controlled by the iPad. The building manager iPad as well can be sync, synced with that iPad to control sound without being in the AV room. This is the lighting board for the Commonwealth Auditorium. There are various lights. We have different colors ranging from red, blue, and white. Always ensure when closing the building that the glass that separates the AV room from the Commonwealth Auditorium is locked as we have very expensive equipment located in the Commonwealth booth. This is the chair store closet. This is where we store all the chairs including podiums and screen flexes. Also, whenever a group is having an event, 
always ensure that there are no tables outside of the room that could possibly be a fire hazard. As you can see, this is the Chesapeake room, Chesapeake A to be specific. Within Chesapeake A, you will also see doors that lead to the balcony. Always ensure when closing the building to lock those doors as well. Chesapeake A is the largest part of the Chesapeake rooms. And as you can see, this is hardwood floor. Therefore, you can utilize the tape in this room. This is the table storage closet. This is where we keep six foot tables, round tables, and also we have stages that are located within this closet within Chesapeake A. The air walls separate Chesapeake A, B, and C from each other. Chesapeake B is the smallest of the three rooms. And all the rooms have separate projectors. Some groups may request to utilize all three screens. That is a more complicated AV setup. But to ensure that all three screens are working, the screen on the projector screen in Chesapeake A and Chesapeake C will be on input two. And the screen in Chesapeake B will be on input one. To control the air walls, always ensure that you are not overextending the air walls or closing them too tightly as they break occasionally which will require you to move them manually and report the problem in your building manager shift report. Within Chesapeake B, there's also a door located that leads into the catering office. Where you can see the sound amplifiers for both for all the rooms in Chesapeake and is a way for you to separate the various rooms and how the sound is being synced. Now we're interesting Chesapeake C. Chesapeake C has the same basic setup. It also has access to a balcony, which you would ensure that that would be closed as well. Near Chesapeake C is another storage closet that you see. There are chair straps. Chair straps are used when there are 200 chairs, more than 200 chairs within a room. You have to strap the chairs using the chair straps in accordance to fire code. If you take the service elevator down to the first floor, otherwise the basement, you would notice that there is another huge storage closet that we keep all of the extra tables, chairs, the easels. There's also a path that leads to the loading dock from the basement storage closet. Always ensure that you close the loading dock before you leave the building. The one on the left side, if you press close, it will close automatically. The door on the right side, you have to hold the down button for the close completely. This is the games desk area. And against the wall, there is a portion of the wall that can be lifted to control all the lights within the games desk area. Ensure that all those are turned off when you close the building. Straighten up any furniture that you see that is not already straightened. Lastly, we have Lodge 1. Lodge 1 has a lot of furniture as well, so always ensure that it is straightened. It also has a projector screen that is nearest the wall to the stage. There is also access to a DVD player and light equipment. When closing the building, remember that there are three important entrances to the building that need to be locked up at the end of the night. That includes the door that we manually lock nearest the post office. You will look above you and there is a switch that turns off the doors. Once you do that, 
there is a knob located in the middle of the doors that you would turn to the left to lock and do this to both the inside and the outside doors to lock the lodge one doors there is a box nearest the outside door as you will place the master key in and turn to the left to unlock it you would do the same process and turn it to the left once again. Always push on the doors to make sure that they are locked or to ensure that they are open. The inside doors of Lodge 1, you do not need to lock. Doing a fire alarm, the appropriate procedure is to get everyone out of the building in a steadfast manner and then to lock all of the main entrance doors. Once those doors are locked, you would stand outside of the main entrance door nearest the office and wait for the campus police to go inside the building, check on the fire, and then notify you that it is all clear to go back in the building. Ensure that no one enters the building while the fire alarm is still going on or while the campus police and the fire department are still inside. My mission is to set up all the AV that building managers are responsible for, including setting up an LCD pack for a room, setting up a wireless mic, a wireless lavalier mic, a podium mic, as well as a Jeff cart. This is a Jeff cart. tends to make our sets more easier to manage. First thing I'm going to do is put down the projector screen located over here near the wall. Now I'm going to adjust the podium. You always want to make sure that the Jeff cart is positioned in between the podium and the screen. Now this is the LCD pack for Chesapeake B. As you can see it is labeled Chesapeake B. Inside of the LCD packs there should be a remote for Chesapeake B. It should be a VGA cable as well as an extension cord. Labeled on the VGA cables, there's plug in the wall and plug out of the wall. Usually the shorter cable it's always the one that you plug into the wall. Now I'm going to plug that into the wall outlet over here. Always make sure that you tighten the knobs on the VGA cable to ensure it doesn't fall out. Now I'm going to coil a little bit of the wire and place it under, underneath the Jeff cart. Then I'm going to bring the VGA cable up through the side of the Jeff cart. Place it underneath. Now the next thing I'm going to do is give the Jeff, give the Jeff cart some power. I'm going to plug it directly into the wall.
Now the Jeff car has power. I'm going to connect the XLR cables. to ensure that it has sound. I'm about to plug the XLR cable up to the female end. This is the male connector right here. Okay, can you start with now I'm going to again? Now I'm going to plug the female end of the XLR cable until the mic level out. Now the Jeff car has sound. So now I'm coiling the wire. Now I'm going to plug the female end of the XLR cable into the wired mic. The wired mic doesn't require any batteries. And to make sure that the wired mic is working, you would go to the front of the Jeff card. And ensure that the Jeff car is turned on using this button. Sure that the master is turned up. And because we plugged into five, we turn up five. And then we will test out the mic. Testing, one, two, check mic one, two. As you can see, the mic is working now. The wireless lavaliers, which are basically the clip-on mics that speakers typically use. And this, as you can see, you have to put it together. And this also requires power, so you have to plug this in. I usually plug it into the side of the Jeff cart. Plug it into here. And now you can use the same XLR cable that we use in, for the mic and plug the female in and ensure that it's not plugged into line and is into mic or else it will make an excruciating noise. Uh, not on line. It is uh, on mic. And ensure that the wireless live layer base is turned on. Into the live layer. And this is the live layer. You will first turn it on. First turn it on. And the light will turn green once it is on. Testing. Check mic one, two. Bingo. Now to utilize the wireless mics that are located within the Jeff cart, you don't need to plug anything in because they already are accompanied with the sound uh, from the Jeff cart. So you would just turn it on. And show, always ensure that the batteries, that there are fresh batteries in the microphone because a lot of times the batteries will run out and a group will have a problem with the microphone and it's a very simple solution to change the batteries. This right here has no batteries actually. The battery's about to die. As you can see, 
all the leftover wires that we have from the AV from earlier. This is a fire hazard. As you can see, you can triple the cords. Fire and a safety hazard. So you will grab your nice tape right here. You will first straighten the wires. into a 90 degree angle. Take a piece of tape. And what I usually do is take a medium sized length of tape and tape down the beginning of the wires. another medium sized piece of tape and take down the end of the wires. And then you will use the roll of tape, place it at the far end, and you can do it one of two ways or however you feel comfortable. I usually put my foot down at the end and roll it out this way and sort of walk it down my foot. Stomp it down, and that way you have a nice trip proof taping job. Now, is it, it is in according with fire code and is no longer a safety hazard. Wires along the against wires along the wall do not need to be taped against the wall because they are out of the way and therefore do not pose a tripping threat. And it also saves us tape. In the York and James room, always ensure that the VGA cables are properly connected into the wall outlet. Also in York and James, make sure that the sound knob nearest the VGA cable input is turned up. To coil probably the XLR cables, first you would take whichever hand you are comfortable with the most and you would sort of cradle it with that hand. And using your other hand, your thumb and your index finger, you would give it a twist to the right underneath your elbow and go in a circular motion. Always ensuring that the length of the coil is about your forearm's length.
number one, unlock the door to get in. And if you have the light on, you have to turn off the alarm. Come on in. Okay, you go to the box and put it in and turn it off. And your alarm is off, turn on your lights and you are in for the evening. Then you go over to your block, in which there are two. Come around here. You have AV and building manager block. Put in your big wide key and these are the keys you will use throughout the day doing your shift. Okay. Now, we will go to the safe in which this is your big safe. I remind people each straw starts off at $70, 27 ones, $30 and quarters, $10 and dimes, $2 and nickels, and $1 and pennies. So when you open up your safe, no, I'm not going to show you how to open up safe right now, but and this is locked while I'm here. When you open up your safe, you take out your drawer and you count it as such. This should be in the drawer. And that is what you put out on front. You take it out to the front. Come on. And this is all touch screen, so if you touch it, it should it could be blank or it could come on as such. If it does, function screen, no sale. And you put it in the register and you're ready to go for the day. Unlock the doors in which we have a lock. Pad lock that goes through both handles. You've seen that before, right? Unlock it. The key is also down in this drawer. Unlock it. Take it off so you can open up the door and you're ready for business as long as your worker is here. Put the padlock back in there. At the end of your shift, you're going to come over here to your screen and you're going to hit function screen. You can show that. Function screen. You're going to hit reports. Reports. Cashier financial. Run. And I'll tell you how much you took in for the day. Print. In which this little machine will print it out for you. And done, done, done. No sale. You can take out your machine and you take it to the back to count it. Okay? If this green light is not on, your printer, you've ran out of paper. Paper is located right next to the register, right down here. Point down to where the paper is. Just take it out, open it up, and put it back in. Open it up, put the paper in. And it's feeding from underneath. Ready to go. Do everything you have to do anyway. Take your drawer back to the desk. And you count everything in the drawer. I don't know where, how they have you to do it, but I count everything. Five, ten. Once. 14. Okay, we get a total and we subtract $70 from that total because that's the money we started off with. And if we subtract 70 from our total here, it says we took in $8.31. Right now we are over our receipt and we have to go from the bottom, the bottom amount, which says $8.23. <laughs> from our total, 8.23 from our total, which says we are eight cents over right now. Okay, which is a great day. So we take our deposit, which is, and we start with a big money. We don't put change in there. Eight, we take five, six, seven, eight, and we counted 31 cents, quarter, 
nickel a penny, 31. $8.31, we open this drawer and we get the bag to put the money in. We put the bag, money in the bag, which is our count, what we count it. We have our paperwork for the day. In this paperwork, you will get Monday through Friday. It should be right here when you come in. But we get the bags from here. And it's these bags right here that we use to put a deposit in. If we need to roll change, you have a cup that has the individual ones on there. Roll it, please. Makes it easier on the next person. Okay, we put our money in the bag. And we do our paperwork. Monday through Friday, if I'm here, or morning people should fill these out in the morning. And it should tell you who's working and who's the supervisor. And you have your daily totals on here of what they take in. Okay, you take out your paperwork. I'll redo this. From our totals here. Okay. And Lauren's on the desk. And it says we took in $78.31 minus what we started, which gave us $8.31. Right there. Our receipt tells us we took in $8.23. There was no overing, shouldn't be. $8.23. We counted $8.31, which made us. What are eight eight cents? Yeah, eight cents over. I did say that, didn't I? Yeah, eight cents over. Eight cents. And we are over. So I'll mark that out. So we are over eight cents. Right there. We transpose that amount here down here. Eight twenty-three. Nine, eight twenty-three. Our count was eight thirty-one, and we were over eight cents. Which amount in bank should be back to seventy dollars? Paperwork done. Everything on there. All this goes into the bag with your deposit. All this would go into the bag with your deposit, which goes. To the safe. Come on. You coming over? Which goes in the safe along with your deposit. And then you close it up. Lock it up. And you're done with that for the day. Get your paperwork uh, on the weekend. One, you get two sheets. Top and model, two sheets, and this is what's on top. Do sign it. Let me know who shows up to work. And do put it in with your deposit at the end of the day. Okay? Weekend supervisors, here's a note to look. If you need change, go in that deposit bag. Sometimes you'll have enough to break a 20. If it's in the deposit bag. Put in a 20, take out a 10 and two fives and put it back out on the desk. That gives you some leverage on change, right? So you, you can use those deposits from like Friday night and Saturday night if you need change on Sunday night. But it's an even exchange. If you take $20 out, put $20 in. Okay? Thank you. Safe is locked when you're closed, closing. Make sure your door is locked because a lot of people will unlock it to run down to the bathroom and come back. So always try your doors to make sure they're locked and turn on the alarm on your way out. In which you have to put your key back in the key ring and use this to lock up the building. Supervisors and colors in the building, you have to put up signs for the next day events. And they're located right over here. Uh, normally it's one for the next day, but if it's the weekend, you will have three. One for Saturday, Sunday, and one for Monday. Make sure you look at it and see how many you have there. There are nine that go around the building, 
most are at the doors and where you enter the building and two go downstairs by little theater okay there are none that go upstairs if you have an extra one in your hand you missed the spot <laughs> okay but get one and make sure you put them up for the next day and they're located there if you could hear the alarm and you're working here you get out you go to the front of the building toward Jamestown Road and wait for it to be cleared to come back in. Mm -hmm. This fire alarm is for this side of the building. Normally, mm -hmm. if this one goes off, you're gonna hear it. And the other one on the other side will go off. But on the other side, if that one goes off, it doesn't trigger this one for some reason. So if you hear a faint alarm and you hear it from that end of the building, from trickle side of the building, come out, pull the alarm, close the door, get out and go toward Jamestown Road and wait to be accountable. Welcome to the information desk. First, we're gonna open the shutters. All you need to do is pull back the pins and push the shutters right up. Um, after you've opened, you can Make sure everything's welcoming for guests by putting brochures and maps out. Uh, when you get a phone call straight to the info desk, you can just pick the phone up and answer. No need to push any of the other buttons. Um, it looks like this phone call needs to be transferred, so you hit the transfer button on the short tail communicator screen on the computer. To transfer, all you need to do is type in either a number or a name into the transfer box. In this case, it's Casey, so you would type in Casey's name, Casey Van Veen, and you can either uh, transfer it to her office or sh where she'll be able to pick it up, or you can transfer it to her mailbox if you know she's not in the office. So this is the last and found Excel spreadsheet on the computer. It's where we do pretty much everything at the info desk. In the first column, you're going to put your name because you're the person logging in the item, then the date, then a short description, then maybe a lengthier description so someone could identify it, followed by whether you contacted ResLife if it's a key or if, you know, it's an ID and it has someone's name on it. And then you're going to say where you put the item and finally if it was picked up. Make sure to take someone's ID if they're picking something up so you can put their name down. Uh, this next section on the spreadsheet is our lost. So if someone wants to report a lost item, you'd put it on this uh, sheet. It has the same basic setup as the found one. Uh, the next sheet is has to do with tabling. So the info desk is in charge of keeping track of who tables at the Souther Center. And each row has a different group and their bin number, if they have a safe deposit, if they have a poster. Um, what day they start tabling, what day they end their tabling, uh, what organization they are, what they're tabling for, um, the name of the contact person if something goes wrong, and a phone number to contact that person. Uh, this is the safe deposit page. It's very important. Uh, this involves the money we keep in the safe for groups who are tabling. Um, you have to put your, the organization name, the event they're tabling for, whether they're dropping off or picking up. So on the top you would write drop off, and if they're picking up money, you would write pick up right on that space. Um, and then the date they're dropping off or picking up money. Um, and when during the day they dropped it off or picked it up. And this is very important. Uh, whoever deposits or picks up the money, you need to see their ID and you definitely need to get their contact number. So this is the daily schedule. Um, you get an email every day that sends you what's happening in the building. 
So to get that email, go into the Information Desk Outlook email, and then load the PDF file. Which will just pop up like this. And if you just have it on the screen at all times, it's a lot easier to uh, tell people what's going on in the building. So this is the binder we use for the bulletin board reservations. These are for the green felt bulletin boards. Um, so uh, someone, a representative of a group, needs to write down their name, their organization and event, and their phone number. And they need to do it for each day that they want a bulletin board. So the max number of days someone can have a poster is three. And they need to write down their information for all three days. So this is where we keep all of the items that are turned into lost and found. On this farthest left, we have the glasses and sunglasses bin. Then the small personal items bin. Uh, followed by a bin for all the keys and lanyards we get. Then we have uh, non-valuable electronics, such as chargers. Um, then in this top drawer, we have books and notebooks. And then below that, we have a drawer just for umbrellas. In the blue bin, we store clothing and bags. And then finally, these white boxes are used for groups that are tabling in the lobby of Sadler. Um, if you're depositing money, as we talked about previously when we are talking about the log, um, it goes in the top of the safe and in, right into the drawer. It's like a you know post office mail slot. Just stick it right in there. These are the bulletin boards that correspond to the blue binder. Hello Games Desk employees. First part of the opening shift is to go to the Games Desk closet and remove all the objects out of the safe and place them onto the cart. These items include the games controllers and video games. Next, remove the cart from the closet and wheel it to the desk. Remove the items from the cart in order to put them in their right locations. Unlock the games desk. In the games desk, you should find the notebook and the pool racks. The pool balls go on top of the table. The controllers and video games go on the second drawer. The Guitar Hero controllers go behind the games desk. Place the pool cues in their racks. Hang the pool cues at the end of each pool table. Remember to unfold the pool cloths and then place them on the game cart. Remember to unlock the consoles. Most importantly, make sure you charge the video game controllers at the beginning of every shift. If the shuffleboard table needs it, wax it. 
In the next shift, you'll be responsible in repairing pool cues. You can find a chest of everything you need in the top drawer. First, sand the pool cue to remove all of the old glue. Next, place a light dab of glue on top of the cue. Place the tip on top of the cue and then use a holder to hold the tip in place while it dries. Move the cue to the side so it can be finished being repaired after it dries. Once it has dried, then remove the covering. Once the covering has been removed, then around the edges, you will find this utensil also in the chest you use to repair the pool cues. When it's done being repaired, chalk the cue and place it back onto the rack. Inspect the pool cues at every shift. Any ones that are broken, move them to the side. If you see any cues with shiny heads, take out the pick and pick them. For the closing shift, move the items that you originally put in the games desk while opening and place them back on the cart. Remember to brush down all of the pool tables. After the pool tables have been brushed, then place the pool cloth back over the pool table. Place the chargers and pool racks back into the desk. And remember to lock the desk. You must lock all the consoles. And turn off the lights to the pool tables. Finish packing up the cart. And return the cart to the games desk closet and put the objects back into the safe. Chairs should be stored in stacks of 10. To move the stacks, roll the chair cart underneath the stack, grab hold of the top chair, and press down on the cart with your foot or knee. Let's break this movement down. Use your arm and leg strength to control the movement. When dropping off a stack, maintain your hold of the top chair while slowly easing the pressure of your foot or knee and set it down gently. Make sure this doesn't happen. Let's store these six foot tables.
A six foot table cart holds 10 tables. Tables should be stored with the same sides facing each other, top to top and legs to legs. The same holds for round tables. To set up each stage piece, first pull out the bottom legs, then pull up the rod between the top legs and gently bring one side down. Do the same to the other. While stage pieces in the campus center are attached together by straps, Sadler Center stages use hooks. To pull out or fold back a hook, apply slight downward pressure on the side with the hook hole. Let's look at this from beneath the stage. To attach a new stage piece to the hooks, align the new stage piece by the side that has no hooks along the first stage piece, then bring the sides down so that the edges fall over the hooks. When disassembling a stage, start not with the first piece that you set up, but the last, because it doesn't have another stage piece on its hooks. To add stage steps, tighten the knob on each side of the steps. Add skirting to the front and sides of the stage by aligning its velcro to the velcro of the stage. So while the candy desk worker is out, pretty much you're just going to be playing cashier here. Hi, welcome. What can I get for you today? And right now I'm just going to sell a bag of chips. So we hit the Uts button. Chips. And then it comes to a dollar and five cents. So we go to pay screen. And the person gave me exact change. So when that happens, you press cash. If they weren't to do so, then you would put in the amount that they gave you in order for the machine to come up with the change. And that way the totals are good at the end of the day. And that's the end of the transaction. You just hit begin screen and you're back to the main screen. And another important facet of working at the candy counter is bolt candies. And when you sell these, you have to make sure that you get the weights correct because we sell it by a certain amount of pounds. So what you do is you place the amount on the scale and put the weight amount into the cash register by hitting the bulk button. 
and you just search for whatever candy you just put in the bag. So for us, it would be malted milk balls. And then you just put the amount of weight that appears on the scale in the box to the left. And then the machine will total it up and add the tax and everything for how much you've spent. Um, some people look for kind of a dollar amount of candy. For example, somebody might say, I have one dollar and I would like to spend this one dollar on multiple milk balls. So what you do is you put a certain amount in the bag and then put that amount on the scale. And then you type in the price you see on the jar behind you. And then you see, oh, it's over a dollar. So then you would just take some out until you get them down to something a little below a dollar in order to account for tax. And that's how you do it if they ask for it by the dollar. That's it for the candy counter. Welcome to the Campus Center. We're going to take a tour and show you everything that's great about this building. So the handicap exit is controlled by switch 13 in the breaker box. So make sure you turn it on in the morning and off at night when you're closing. This is Trinkle Hall. Uh, it's the major ballroom in the Campus Center. Some of the bigger events are held here, such as Night at the Bars and, you know, the Zombie Run. Uh, we're heading up into the AV section of Strinkle. This is how you lower and raise the projector. So if someone wants to watch a movie, for example, in Trinkle Hall, that's how you'd uh, put the projector up and down. These are the light switches for Trinkle Hall, so make sure they're all turned off at the end of your shift. Now we're headed to the service elevator to go down into the basement of the campus center where there's a storage room for extra chairs and other equipment. So if you ever need chairs or tables and you don't have enough, you can come down to this area and get some more. This is also where you'll find uh, stages if you need to set up a stage for an event in the campus center. Uh, now we're gonna head downstairs to check out Little Theater as well as the AV closet and other areas that are in the lower levels. This is the little theater. A lot of groups will have meetings here and other events. This is a great room because the AV is built right in. Uh, that is where you would plug in an XLR cable. Uh, all the cords are, you need are in the drawer. So if you want to hook up a computer. The chairs in the little theater should be stored against the wall in stacks of five or six. This is the AV closet in the campus center. So for all your AV needs, go right down here. It's right by the little theater. Uh, that's the beacon. It's very useful. It's used to amplify sound and comes with a manual. Projector. Uh, so if someone wants to watch a movie in Trinkle Hall, you'd pull that out and set that up. Lots of cords and cables, extension cords, anything you might need for an event that requires AV. Uh, now we're going to head upstairs using the public elevator rather than the service elevator. This is the court where uh, student groups have offices up on the top floor of the campus center. Building entrances and exits are unlocked and locked using this blunt hexagonal key. This is the only key that you can use the ring to exert force on to turn. Uh, if you do that with any of the other keys, they may break. So you insert the key to the, onto the side of the door and rotate. And you go in the opposite direction to lock the door or unlock the door.
The building manager incorporates many of these workers' skills to ensure that the building operates smoothly and safely.